Father, we thank you for your word. In particular, we thank you for Matthew 24. That is a cool passage. And it's one, Jesus, where you spoke directly to your disciples and really by proxy to us about what was going to happen um, in our time and when we would know you're going to return. And so we thank you that you know what you're talking about and you know the future and we don't. And we're thankful that you are also in control of the future. And so I pray that as we get into this stuff, it's interesting, it's fun to kind of talk about, but I pray more than anything that it would prepare us and ready us for your coming and that we would get busy. Meanwhile, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got actually non-Christian family and friends, Christian family too, but, but mostly non-Christian family and friends, they really love to talk about conspiracy theories. I don't know if you, John, conspiracy theory guy, we've had long talks. <laughs> he likes funny, I like funny. But I mean, I've got family, like Christmas time, it'll be Kevin, what about this? Kevin, what about that? They're not Christians and they don't plan on believing in Jesus, but they just, they like talking about conspiracies and one world government and the Antichrist and it's just kind of a pick and choose of what they want to talk about. But that's not surprising though. Prophecy has always been very interesting to many people. That's why non-Christians and unfortunately some Christians will do things like going to get their fortune told, right? Or they'll go and, and read tarot cards or, or, or maybe you've even read your, your horoscope in the newspaper. It's because we want to know what the future holds, right? We all want to know what the future holds. And, and even in the Christian church, prophecy like this has been discussed and debated for centuries. And by the way, we're not going to settle this in the next three weeks. <laughs> We're not going to settle who's right and who's wrong. And we've even had people in the church wrongfully set dates on exactly when the world would end. So Jesus is going to come back in 1983. It, past 1983, and he hasn't returned, right? Many people have set, set dates. And of course, there's, there's an unhealthy extreme of constantly talking about prophecy. You have people whose their, their entire ministry is, is prophecy and date setting and, and sign tracking. And here's the ironic thing. They actually make a lot of money from doing it. They write the book, Why the World, you know, 75 Reasons Why the World's Going to End in 1992. They make a lot of money. 1992 passes. They keep the money. Jesus didn't come, right? <laughs> right? Pretty, pretty sweet deal for them. They could, then they could just write another book and make more money and keep setting dates. And there's been, you know, people who do this who aren't Christians, psychics and prophets and other things. I mean, you call it the psychic hotline, right? Um, not that we've any, anyone's done that. It's like five dollars a minute or something. It's ridiculous. But and again, they're making tons of money. Prophecy really is a big business, isn't it? And so we wanted to jump into Matthew 24, and we're going to see in a second that they ask these three questions, and we're going to cover them in the next next couple weeks. Now turn with me to 1 Peter 3 first. We're going to jump there for a second. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but, but waiting 2,000 years for Jesus to return does seem like a really long time, doesn't it? It kind of seems like kind of a long time. Peter actually addresses that for us. Many people over the centuries, including the first century, believed that the end was near. I mean, even the, the, the writers of the New Testament were convinced, a lot of them were convinced Jesus was coming back sooner than they thought. And there's been throughout history many good reasons to believe this. I mean, World War II, right? That was, a, that was an incredibly unique time where you see Hitler rising up, such an antichrist figure, and people figured, okay, this is the end of the world, this is the antichrist we've all read about in the Bible. But it wasn't. Uh, Israel, uh, the Jews coming back to their land, you know, about what was 50, 60 years ago. Incredible fulfillment of prophecy. And yet, he hasn't returned yet. Second Peter 3, beginning in verse 3. This is interesting because Peter actually addresses this for us. And then we'll jump back into this at the end because he's going to have some application for us. 3, verse 3. Knowing this verse, that scoffers will come in the last days. Did you know that there's people who scoff at the Bible? There sure is. Walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So in other words, people are going to mock the church for saying, you've been saying for 2,000 years, Jesus is coming back. Where is he? Verse 5. For this they willfully forget 
that the, by the way, willfully forget means they're, they're willingly stupid. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water in the water, by which the world that even existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, when you read the book of Revelation, you see God is, is, is pretty, um, pretty harsh. I mean, he, he wipes the, the world clean, pretty much. Um, and so, in light of that, we see why he's giving people so much time. And so... Folks, I don't know. I don't know if Jesus is coming back in 10 years or if it's 100 years, but I think it's going to be soon, soon in light of 2,000 years. Um, and so this is encouraging for us as Christians, but, but maybe you're a non-Christian. You, you don't consider yourself a Christian. You're, maybe you're sort of a skeptic, uh, a skeptic or, or maybe you profess faith in Jesus, but you don't really take the entire Bible seriously. This passage, I think, is going to help us to begin to take this book seriously because when we see to this morning the things that Jesus is going to prophesy and predict, I think it's pretty incredible. Just Google fulfilled Bible prophecy and see the, the many hundreds of things the Bible has gotten right. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Especially considering when this was written, how long ago it was, it was written. And, and even beyond that, I want to talk through why any of this should matter to us. Now, again, we can talk about this stuff and, and be entertained and it's interesting and it's, co it's controversy and it's... But really, what should our attitude be in light of this? What should we do? How should we live? If Jesus is actually returning, physically, visibly, actually returning, what needs to change in my life and what needs to change in yours? And so let's jump into our passage. Beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> and I mean, if you want to go home and read, you know, Matthew 23, I mean, it was a pretty, pretty intense thing that just happened there, but we don't have time. Verse one, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so this was maybe 30, 31 AD. We know from history, 70 AD, the Roman legions break through the wall in Jerusalem. They burn down the temple. They slaughter the inhabitants. It is, it is ugly what happens to them. And they don't return to the land until 1940, whatever, 1950 something, whatever they came back. That's a long period of time for them not to be in their land. History tells us that apparently the temple was burned to the point where the gold was flowing down the streets. It was just, you guys remember, remember the temple was totally gold-plated. Everything was gold, and the gold was melting down the streets. And so Jesus is basically telling them, the Jews rejected me. There's judgment coming. And then we, then we see in verse 3, the disciples are going to ask him three questions. And one of them is related to the temple thing he mentioned, but two are about what we're going to talk about today. Verse 3. Now, as he sat on the, on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? So, when is the temple going to be destroyed? What will be the sign of your coming? So, the very end when Jesus comes. End of the end of the age. So, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. What are the things that are going to tell us... Uh, when the end is coming. Are there going to be some things that make it pretty clear that the end is coming? Now, back in Matthew 24, there's lots of debate, again, about this, of different views on prophecy. Some believe, I think wrongly, that everything we read in Matthew 24 has already been fulfilled in 70 AD, which I don't think has happened. I don't think is true. Jesus didn't physically return in the sky in 70 AD, like we'll read next week. Some believe much of this needs to happen in the future, I would agree. And some would say, this is all just metaphorical language for some future event, but we can't really be sure, and, and I disagree really strongly with that. Um, and so let's jump into this together. Beginning in verse 4. And I think we're going to see that it's getting close. There's a bunch more I wanted to say about prophecy, but I don't have time, so... Let's jump into this. Verse 4. <clears throat> Verses 4 and 5. So what would be the sign of the end of the age? Jesus, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. 
Notice what he says. Take heed that no one deceives you. Who is he talking to? Is he talking to believers or non-believers? He's talking to believers. Why would Jesus give a warning about deception if believers can't be deceived? What would be the point? That'd be, that'd be like, Darcy, watch out for the lake in the middle of the aisle. Don't fall in. What's the point? It's not, it doesn't exist. It's not true. It's right. And so, horrible example, but just throwing that out there. It's amazing to me that in all three accounts of this teaching, Mark 13 and Luke 21, it's all this, the same teaching, just some small differences. Jesus begins by saying, do not be deceived. This will be the number one issue in the church at the end of the age. And lo and behold, this is exactly what we're seeing. We're going to read about war and famine and plagues and false teachers, but those things have always been around. They're going to get worse, but those things have always been around. But there's something happening in our time that is very unique, and that is deception in the church among true believers in Jesus. Not just the false believer, but among true believers. And I have a long list of examples, and we're just going to quickly get through some of them because, again, I can go for long on this. Ask the average believer in the church what the gospel is. What kind of answer will you get, typically? Many will have no clue. You look at things like the prosperity movement, where, where they, they have large churches, three to 400 million members in the entire world, teaching that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy and successful, and they, they run that. That's, that's deception. There's other movements like IHOP, not the pancake place, but International House of Prayer in Kansas, right? That they're sucking in young people. And they're praying, and you say, man, prayer is good. What's wrong with that? And yet you realize what they're praying about. They're actually praying that we could take over the government or Jesus can't come back until we do. By the way, how Jesus takes over the government in Revelation, he comes and kills everybody. That's how he takes over the government. I mean, frankly, that's what he does, right? And so they're talking about the seven mountains of the arts and science and government, and Christians have to get into take over these things. It's not what the Bible says. Turn on Christian television, right? We turn on Christian television. It's a disaster. You look at the movements, the ecumenical movement, where while Christian churches are joining hands with Mormons and joining hands with JWs and joining hands with Roman Catholics, and we're saying, let's all get along. We're all going to be friends, and we all believe the same thing, which isn't true. Mass deception is happening. And it's interesting that a lot of these groups say this. The end times are going to be marked by a massive revival. Revival. People are going to get saved. Things are going to get better. Here's the weird thing. The Bible actually says the exact opposite. The Bible actually says that the end times, the last days, are going to be marked by massive deception and massive apostasy from the church. The Bible says the Antichrist will use signs and miracles to deceive people, which we'll see next week. And yet, these groups are doing the same thing and claiming, just because we have miracle signs and wonders, that, hey, we must be legit. We must be from God. And yet, the Bible actually warned us that these things would happen. So it's interesting how it's actually opposite from what the Bible says. <clears throat> now, you read this in verse, verse 5. He says, many will come in my name and say, I am the Christ. Okay, there have been people throughout history who have claimed, I am the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, some of them have been in mental hospitals, admittedly, but some have actually gained followers, have actually started religions. Um, and there's, you know, even currently it's happening. And it's going to happen more and more and more as the end draws near. And we'll see that next week. But I wonder if this can also apply not only to people who say, I'm Jesus Christ, but also people who claim to speak for Jesus. In other words, people who are coming up to you and claiming, I have a new revelation from God. God told me this. God told me that. Whenever somebody tells you, God told me this or that, not that God can't do that, but a flag should pop up immediately. Why? Somebody walks up to me and says, God told me this, Kevin, about for you. How do I test that? And, and why doesn't God talk to me? Are there two tiers of Christians? One that God talks to and one others, most others that he doesn't? Again, I'm not saying God can't prompt us or nudge us or work in our, work in our hearts, but again, how do we test these things? So it's interesting. I think that kind of thing is going to get worse and worse and worse. I think we should be very careful to say God said and just say, you know, I'm getting this feeling. I'm thinking it through. What do you think? Maybe just maybe some, even if God did tell you that, maybe it's maybe healthier to say that. Verse 6, continuing. <clears throat> 
So how do we know the end is coming? And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Boy, is that happening. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And notice Jesus says, this is the beginning, but it's not the end yet. It's like the, a pregnant woman beginning to get birth pains, but it's not the end. It's just the beginning, right? It's going to get worse and worse and worse until the end. Now he talks about war. We have plenty of war. We see Iran taking over the Middle East. We see Syria as a mess. We see Boko Haram in Africa, militant Muslim groups all over the world terrorizing. Not, not just Muslim groups, all sorts of groups, right? Um, what else do we see here in verse 6? We see this idea of, in verse uh, 7, this idea of pestilence. What did your NIV say for that? Famines. Say plague? Hmm? Does it say pestilence? Famines, pestilence, earthquakes? That's why I like when you King James. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> pestilence is essentially a plague. Um, and we're seeing that as well. We're seeing, of course, things like Ebola. Anybody seen anything on the Zika virus? You guys seen that on the news? Zika virus? Basically, a pregnant person gets the Zika virus from a mosquito bite, and the baby's born incredibly deformed, small brain, really weird-looking head. It's just this brand new disease. People don't even know what to do about it. Um, you know, there, there's antibiotic superbugs and all these other things that, that could come and are coming. They're only going to get worse. They're only going to get worse. He mentions here this idea of earthquakes. And I think this whole thing on earthquakes is pretty interesting. And I won't go too long on this. Um, when I talk about 6.0 magnitude, do you get what I'm talking about with earthquakes? If, if Hodgson were to have like a 6 magnitude earthquake, that would be really bad. It's a really bad earthquake. That's like a pretty intensely bad earthquake. But it's interesting that, that before the 1900s, it, they were actually very rare. Um, you look at the beginning of the 1900s, you get four, five. You get to the 1980s to the 1990s, you're getting them in the 300s. 1990 to 94, they saw over 747 of them. And just from 2000 to 2007, there was 1,198 6.0 magnitude earthquakes, not including all the other ones beneath that which is triple the amount of the last 100 years combined. Now again, it's interesting, and I think it might be an indicator that Jesus is coming soon, like we said. It's only going to get worse. Verse 9. <clears throat> then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Oh man, Valentine's Day sermon, Kevin. Learn next time, learn next time. Then they will deliver you up. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. I don't celebrate Valentine's Day. What, what do I care, right? <laughs> Verse, going to a movie with my roommate. What do I care about these things? Verse 9. <clears throat> then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for, night, for my name's sake. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit next week, this idea of pre-trib and post-trib. Are the Christians going to be here for the really bad stuff? That actually doesn't matter in a way because what he's saying here happens before the really bad stuff. So, it's interesting. I'm going to read this. You don't got to turn there. But Mark 13, verse 9, is the parallel passage, and Jesus adds something in. Um, and I'm just going to read this, because I'm kind of studying all three at once, because they're all sort of the same thing. Um, but Mark 13, verse 9. And we'll talk about Christian persecution. 13, verse 9. But watch out for your... This is exact, the exact same conversation. But watch out for yourselves. For they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the, in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. Verse 10. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's interesting. That's actually a kind of a hopeful part of the fact that we're going to be imprisoned and, and so forth. Now, throughout history, there is an estimated, and I think this is probably a very low estimate in all honesty, there's an estimated 70 million Christians who have died for being a Christian in human history or in the last 2,000 years. Out of that, in the last century, so 70 million, out of that, in the last century, 45 and a half million have been killed for their Christian faith. That's a huge jump from 30 million, basically, in 1,900 years to... 45 and a half million just in this last century alone. We see, we've seen this in Muslim countries. We've, we've seen the, the mass slaughter of people in communist countries, right? Notice what it says here, though, uh, in uh, 
End of verse 9. He says, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Question for you. Is Canada a nation? So are we exempt from this, right? This includes North America. It's coming, folks. Now, many people are trying to fight, especially in the U.S., to keep the United States a Christian country, if it ever was. And that's a big question. But Jesus is clear here that what we see in Canada on a micro level, so there's just sort of an animosity building towards the church, it's only going to increase as time goes on. Now, we are spiritually lax and we are mediocre in the church here in Canada. But being a Christian in the rest of the world costs you big. It costs you something. And so to think we're immune to this is absolutely ridiculous. And many of us, I know, are hoping for the preacher of rapture, but this verse is saying before any of that, we're going to be persecuted. And it's already happening all over the world. So again, why do we think we're better than them? Why do we think we're exempt? We're not. I don't think we will be. Verse 10. I feel bad for our kids and grandkids. Let's just put it that way. Verse 10. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. I actually underlined this idea of many will be offended, and I just thought about our culture, our, our politically correct culture, where everybody's offended by everything. And I thought, man, this is pretty accurate. Good job, Jesus. This is cool. Like, all this rubbish about political correctness and, and tolerance, Jesus says many people will be offended. The world calls the Christian church, you're a bunch of intolerant bigots. And yet, that's actually a cover for how they truly feel. They, they just hate the church. It's ironic because they call us haters, but they're actually the ones who, who hate. And this is only, only going to get worse and worse and worse. We're seeing this in the States. We're seeing this in Canada. The government is beginning to legislate morality, gay marriage, abortion, and so forth. It's Here's my prediction. It's going to get to the point where if... I was your pastor, whoever was your pastor, were to denounce gay marriage from the pulpit, the church would lose its nonprofit status. It's coming probably 10, 20 years. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. The pastor goes to prison and you lose your nonprofit status. And by the way, in a church this size, losing your nonprofit status is basically death for the church. Good luck paying property taxes and all the taxes that we're exempt from for being a church, right? And so I think during this apostasy, churches, there's still going to be churches, and there's still going to be churches that are full. They're just not going to be very good. They're just going to be very watered down, and, you know, the churches will always be around, but probably not very biblical. And so all nations will hate you for my... Notice it says, for my name's sake. So it's not just people hate you because you're a jerk. They hate you because you're a Christian. There's a, there's a difference there. If people dislike you just because you're a miserable person, then that's your problem. You need to fix that, right? But if it's for your Christian testimony, then... Rejoice. It's a good thing. Verse 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. We'll talk about this more next week. I don't have time, but we talked a lot about uh, false prophets in previous sermons. And Jesus mentions false prophets more than once in this section, which is probably an indicator that it's right pretty important. Okay, verse 12. And then we'll have application time. Someone's laughing at me. Okay. Verse 12, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. In our world, we see in entire governments collapsing because of greed, wickedness, and lawlessness. Countries are in civil wars. We see even good, quote-unquote, good governments like the U.S. and Canada beginning to legislate morality in favor of the ungodly. Here's, a, here's one of the perfect examples that we're seeing in the United States. Has anybody been keeping track of the Planned Parenthood thing in the United States? Anybody? The Planned Parenthood videos? Go online and look up Planned Parenthood videos. Basically, it, Planned Parenthood is basically a women's health clinic that they do various things for women's health, but it's basically an abortion mill is what it is. It's, it's, they mostly do abortions. They do some other things as well. And a guy went undercover <clears throat> and took undercover video talking to executives, and he found out a lot of dirt on them. And, and some of the dirt, which... I'll just be blunt about it. It's not very pretty. It is basically after they would, they would abort the baby, they would take the baby's heart and the baby's liver and the baby's brain and they would sell it for profit. And he found this out and it's on the video. They're bragging about buying Mercedes with the money they got from it and so forth. So, but here, here's a really interesting thing about this. They went to court. They were talking about lawlessness, right? They went to court. Not only was Planned Parenthood not indicted, but the guy who made the videos was indicted. <laughs> 
for, get this, trying to buy baby parts. Now question, who was the seller? Planned Parenthood. Why weren't they indicted for being the seller and he was indicted for being the buyer? Lawlessness, right? Lawlessness. It's happening. Lawlessness. It makes no sense. You're killing a human being and selling its organs. That's like mafia stuff, right? We see this, and this is actually happening more in the States, frankly, than here, probably just because of their population. We see this in the States as well. There's Christian bakers. They're fined $140,000, $150,000 for refusing to bake a gay wedding cake. They even give them a place across the street they could go to. And because of emotional damage, they, they, they sue them and they win. We see things like transgender washrooms in our schools, and we see, here's one that I don't like, we see kindergarten kids being taught sexual things I'm embarrassed to talk to you about as an adult. <laughs> and it's being taught to our little kids in public schools. So lawlessness, lawlessness, it's coming. We see it all over the world, it's coming here. Notice what he says here, the love of many will grow cold. This could be the idea of mothers and their children with abortion, but we also are going to see this in the church. The love of many will grow cold. Here's a quote I had. I, I pasted it in my notes. He says, The love of the brotherhood gives way to mutual hatred and suspicion. And you guys remember we went through Philippians together? This is why that book of Philippians was so important. The ideas of unity and love and truth. Those things are so incredibly important for the church to not let our love grow cold. Love for Jesus and love for each other, right? <clears throat> Verse 13. But he, after all these things are going to happen, bad stuff, bad stuff, 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, we're a church that believes in eternal security, that we're once saved, always saved. However, Sometimes it's best to just let a verse say what it says. A couple years ago, I would have spent a half hour explaining why this verse means physical and not spiritual. And Let's just let Jesus say what he says. See, because the end of the age is going to be marked by massive amounts of Christians falling away, giving up, being weakened, being deceived, and being taken out. Now, what does saved ultimately mean? I'm not going to sit here and say I know the whole point is we have to hold on. Now, there's different kinds of apostasy. Some people just say, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I'm walking away. We've seen those people, right? Some people will faint from too much pressure. So they just go, I can't handle this anymore. It's too much. And one very common way of someone falling away is just the slow, steady slide. I'm in my car. I'm in neutral. I'm going uphill. If I'm not progressing, I'm what? Sinking. And that's the Christian life. If you're not progressing, you are sinking. So don't let your belief in eternal security make you lazy and mediocre. You need to endure. You need to endure. Jesus says that those who endure to the end shall be saved. We need to endure. We need to be faithful. And with God's help, we can do it. Right? Amen? We can do it. I tried the amen thing <laughs> in some other church. And they were just... It was so bad. I was like, not even a pity one? And they just... Well, you guys are nicer to me. Things are only going to get worse, folks. We have to hang on. We have to know our Bibles or we're going to be deceived. We, we have to be in Christian community. And here's the thing. To many of us, to be honest, Christian community means very little to you in, in, in some ways to me. But a time is coming where it will matter a lot. When everybody's against you, and the Christian community are the only ones who are going to be with you and who are going to support you. The church is really going to matter in that time. And here's the thing. If you're struggling now in your Christian life, welcome to the Christian life. But if you're hardly hanging on, what's going to happen to you once it actually costs you something to be a follower of Jesus? Maybe you'll step it up, but the chance is also that you will fall off the edge, right? So we have to endure. We have to endure. Verse 14. And then we'll go back to Peter for some application. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, there's about 2,000 languages in the world that need a Bible translation. They have no Bible in their language. And there's about a 1.5 billion people who have never heard the name of Jesus. Now, 
is this verse saying that Jesus cannot or will not return until we finish that job? Can our actions influence his timing? Can we speed it up or can we delay it? Jump, jump to verse 36 in Matthew 24. Verse 36. And this will be our third week, but we'll jump into that in our third week. 24 verse 36. <clears throat> but of that day, the, the day where he comes, an hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jump to verse 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Verse 44. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you may not expect. So does that sound like we can influence his timing, speed it up, slow it down? I think it'll come, and we're not going to. And like we're going to see in, in our third week, just like the days of Noah, everyone thought nothing was going to happen until it started to rain, right? Revelation 14, you don't got to go there, but uh, Revelation 14, verse 6, <clears throat> I think this might actually be what he's talking about, where an angel does in one day what took us 2,000 years. Revelation 14, verse 6. This is in the end. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And so I wonder if that's going to be what Jesus is talking about, the gospel Basically, God, Jesus giving everyone a chance right at the end to hear if, if we failed our job, which at this rate we, we, we are going to, unfortunately. And here's the thing. I think sometimes our views, whether we're pre-trib or post-trib, and we'll talk about what those are next week. I think at times, and the verse I just read, I think this influences the way we think about this. We assume we have more time. We assume we have more time. And folks, we may not have more time. Right? Based on what we just read, we need to be ready. He's coming at an hour we don't expect. We need to send or become missionaries to reach those people. We can't presume on God's patience. We need to be ready. I got a verse for you here. You don't got to turn there, but it seems like you guys are following me pretty well today. Luke 21, beginning in verse 16. I just want to read this just to... Be a little bit of encouragement here. Bad stuff is coming. Are we ready? <clears throat> Luke 21, verse 16. Same, exact same passage, just in a different gospel, and there's always little details that aren't in the other ones. <clears throat> he says this, verse 16, you will, betray, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Well, that's nice. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But look what he says here in verse 18. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. Well, well what? He means we're not going to die? No, he just said we will. But in the big picture, not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. Matthew 10, 28 says, And do not fear those who can kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Because that's what's going to happen. They're going to kill the body. But rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So turn back with me to 2 Peter 3. We're just finished with this. So end times is interesting. It's fun to talk about conspiracies, but when we look at what's happening, it's actually fairly serious. 3 beginning in verse 10. And I just had three final points, which is on, this is all on half a piece of paper. When the Bible talks about the end of the world, the point is to give information, but the bigger point is to motivate us to action. That's always the point of it. And I've got family, cousins and, and brothers and different things, who all they do is obsess with researching the end times. They don't obey the Lord. They don't go to church. They don't lead their families well. They don't share the gospel. But by golly, they study 12 hours a day about the end times. Worthless. If you're not actually living for him, worthless. You've wasted your time. I had a half-brother just obsessed with that stuff for many years. Waste of time if you're not going to do something about it. Verse 10. 
great part about epistles is they give their own application. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, so it's sudden, we don't know when it's going to come, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So that's coming. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? There's our application. Since this is coming, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements, elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So there is hope. At the end of all this garbage, we're going to see hope. Three final points, and then we'll pray. And we'll talk more about the actual end next week, the Antichrist, and all the various views on that. And it should be, should be good. If you, like that, if you like that type of thing. Three things that eschatology should help us with. Number one, it should motivate us to live a godly life and share the gospel. Time is running out. Time is running out. In all those places I mentioned, but here too, in Fisher Branch, in Hodgson, in Pegasus, and all the various areas around here, time is running out. Now here's the thing. Some of us are afraid. And this, isn't a, this isn't a bash on you, but this is just reality. Some of us are afraid to do simple things like come up here and share announcements or talk to a neighbor or talk to a stranger. What are you going to do once things get hard? Honestly, <laughs> you can't say hi to your neighbor. What's going to happen when your neighbor has a knife and he's coming to arrest you? Like It's coming, right? I think those of us with more experience and different gifts, we need to learn to come alongside those others who maybe need to grow or who maybe who are shy, and we need to help them in that way. It's also given to warn us that many will fall away, um, many are going to be deceived. Remember, if Satan can't take your salvation, he sure as heck is going to try and make you fruitless and make you an embarrassment to the faith. Whether you believe in eternal security or not, Satan can make a Christian fruitless. He's done it. A million times. And here's the final point, and a little bit more encouraging. It should encourage us. Jesus promised when he left that I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when I'm done, I'm going to come back. And so he's coming for us. This is good news. This is good news. But here's the thing, folks. Jesus' return isn't good news for the rest of the world that doesn't know him. It's bad news. He comes back for them. It's bad news. We're going to talk about that next time where it says, he takes one, the other is left. He takes one, the other is left. We think the taking is the rapture. The taking is the bad part. The ones left are the ones that are okay. And so let's not focus so much on what we get in heaven while you have neighbors and friends and family that you can take along with you, right? We can take them with us. They don't have to be here during all this bad stuff. We can take them with us. All right? Let's pray. And then eat tacos, I guess. I think we're doing today. <laughs> Just add that in. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for all you're doing in this church. And uh, thank you, Jesus, that you told us beforehand what would happen and what you would do. I thank you so much for that. You didn't leave us in the dark. You didn't leave us as orphans. You gave us your spirit to, lie to, uh, to, lead, to lead us and to, to comfort us and to guide us and to work in our hearts. And someday you're going to come back. And whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, you're going to come back. You're going to make this world right again. And, and God, I thank you so much that though there is a battle going on, we have the Bible that gives us the last page. We win. Amen for that. That's so good. And yet, while we're waiting... We aren't just to stare up at the sky and do nothing, but we have a job to do. And so, God, I just pray that you would strengthen me and that you would help me change and that you would help these folks to change as well. And so we pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen.